into the inner verse. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of the Interverse podcast. I'm your host, Chance, and may the show you're about to listen to help you better invoke the coherent creative intelligence of the source and singularity of all life. Because sometimes we could really use the help down here in the realm of material incarnation. In 2024, that seems particularly true, and even though we are no longer in the so-called dark ages of history, we seem to be experiencing a type of pendulum swing in the complete opposite direction, with such an oversaturation of artificial light that the obfuscation of the true and natural reality often seems just as absolute that it is sometimes like society is flying blind into a comprehensive collapse. One element of the unnatural illumination that most people are particularly ignorant about, despite being utterly immersed in it, is the total saturation of man-made electromagnetic fields, which form a simmering soup of unrestricted dissonance so absolute in most places of the world that one practically must become a nomadic Luddite to have any chance of avoidance at all. And while the numbers of people who are noticeably sensitive to these EMF fields may yet be small, many wonder if the whole cooties scam was in part just a cover story for the increasing quantities of folks crossing over the threshold of negative health consequences as the full spectrum warfare dominates an ever widening range of the light spectrum's bandwidths. This very conundrum is what our guest for the, the episode is here to share her story and solutions about having experienced the extremes of EMF hell and come out the other side as a canary in the coal mine for the future of our technological existence. Her name is Julia Lupine, and in the course of her very interesting life thus far, she's actually lived the off-grid, nomad, homeless, survivalist lifestyle in her avoidance of the Forest of Satan Trees, also known as Cell Towers, and finally landed in a stable place with her own herd of goats and a homestead closer to nature than most. She's recently published a book called Under a Rock, an electrosensitive survival guide, and to quote a particularly illuminating passage about our precarious place in human history, the book says, We live in an extraordinary era in the development of man-made capabilities for handling electromagnetic phenomenon. Electronic engineering's maturity, as it is found here at the early end of the new millennium, is exactly equivalent in professional and competent scientific development to that of the sewage treatment systems in use in the urban ghettos of medieval Europe, in which human waste was considered competently disposed of by collecting it in urns and pots, which were emptied out the windows of domiciles onto the streets below. And although this is a graphic metaphor, its accuracy is pretty much bulletproof, which is why it's great to have trailblazers like Julia here to help other EMF sensitives and those of us who want to mitigate its unnoticed effects to know exactly what we're up against and what we can do to live the healthiest and most fulfilling lives possible. So let's get into it. Everybody welcome the desert dwelling dark forces dispeller and ultra grounded goat herding homesteader Julia Lupine. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on Interverse. Well, hey, Chance, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, uh, first off, I can't take uh, credit for that quote. That was my friend Gary Duncan, and I quoted him in my book. So yeah, just to set the record straight on that one. But I do have some great quotes myself, too. <laughs> that's true, yeah. But that, <laughs> that illustration was just too good. I felt like yeah, that's Yeah, it's the... too good to let go. <laughs> but 
he tells it the, uh, the poop brush picture but uh-huh. and and it was a cool synchronicity as you describe your your life story to even meet this gary guy but maybe we can back up a little bit before you started actually learning what was going on and uh you know your your lifestyle how you got to where you're at now uh, cuz your story is very different than most people's 20s and 30s yeah for sure well i um come from originally come from uh fairfield county connecticut and in where i grew up it wasn't considered normal for people to go live in caves you know or dumpster dive or hitchhike but anyway i always thought outside the box a little bit so um, fast forward a little bit in when I was almost 30, I was living outside Moab, Utah, and um, just embracing the backpacking lifestyle and um, going and living in caves for fun. Um, and I because I had an interest in wilderness survival and just wanted to live off the land and stuff. So anyway, that was when I first started noticing that there was a big difference in my um, functional capabilities when I was in the wilderness versus when I was in town. And this, these differences became especially apparent when I would pick up my cell phone and make phone calls, which, was, which I usually did when I'd go back into town after a few days of backpacking. And I started experiencing this burning pain in the side of my head where I'd hold the phone and headaches and just um, this didn't happen when I wasn't on the phone. And I, um, I'd never heard of a electrosensitivity, or I'd heard that maybe cell phones could give you cancer, but I wasn't too worried about it, you know. And there was, just wasn't the same information um, almost 15 years ago as there is now. Um, so anyway, I, you know, thought maybe I was going a little bit crazy, but I, st- you know, eventually tried to stop using the phone so much and. Um, eventually hit it with a rock because it pissed me off way, way, you know, one too many times. Um, but yeah, this went on for my, with a worsening of my symptoms, it went on for several years. And I um, eventually just started living in caves and off grid most like way by off grid. I mean, um, as far away from cell towers as I could get. And um, it became so it wasn't even about being fun anymore. It was just survival because I started feeling really horrible as soon as I'd get to town. And um, obviously, it was hard to have a job during this time. I did some freelance painting and landscaping, but it got harder and harder. So I would, you know, just work the minimum to get whatever money I could get to buy food. And I was also uh, foraging fruit off the trees and um, doing some dumpster diving and, um, you know, just making it, making ends meet the best I could. But um, anyway, um, should I keep going with the story here? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, even though it's not exactly on the same topic as EMF, the sur- like survival skills and primitive skills part of it all. That's something that I feel has a lot of value. It's like a lost art that previous generations of humanity from time immemorial would have just passed from like parents to children forever. That I think one of the reasons why it seems maybe at first glance so crazy to imagine like, well, we have to have this technology, even if it's kind of bad for us, like something's going to kill you eventually, right? (laughs) So we might as well keep using it because we don't know how to live without it. But if we had, even a modicum of those survival skills, nature, (laughs) there's this thing about nature where every organism has what it needs somewhere present in its environment that's accessible to it. But like we've lost the eyes to see what is accessible to us and the skills to gather what is accessible to us. I mean, you were like catching rabbits and squirrels and, you know, you, you have probably got this confidence of, well, even if you took away everything technological, I could make it right. And 99% of people don't have that. So I find this part of the story particularly interesting. Uh, For sure. And uh, well, the interesting thing about not using technology is that when you need to talk to somebody, they'll show up. If you don't have a cell phone, it happens all the time. And the um, human wireless network, that's a real thing. Yeah, the synchronicities and we call it 
living on Canyon standard time too, because we also don't always know what time it is, but we just look at the sun and you can kind of, you know, it goes from one end of the sky to the other. It's pretty simple. And you can kind of tell time that way. And you don't need an alarm clock because when you sleep with the site with the light cycles, you just automatically wake up when it's light and fall asleep when it's dark. I mean, I had horrible insomnia where I wouldn't sleep for days. And that went away instantly when I moved to the desert. So I still don't use artificial lights at night, although I could, but I don't. I'll use a red LED headlamp sometimes, but I'll avoid the blue light wavelengths. And that's not the same as EMF. I don't have a sensitivity to it, so to speak, but it affects the circadian rhythms and you just feel better without it, you know, and sleep. Yeah, I had a guest on, I don't know, a year or two ago named Jackie Joy, who she was diagnosed with Lyme disease. And, you know, that's a whole other can of worms about what that even is and <laughs> how basically they prescribed her just a nuclear bomb of antibiotics. And wow. they, you know, the doctors would say, well, if that doesn't work after three months, we'll just give you another round of intense antibiotics. So she didn't want to go that route and utterly annihilate her gut. Interesting that you brought up in your book that there's a correlation between gut health issues and EMF sensitivity. But anyway, Jackie, this previous guest of mine, she pretty much restructured her entire life to avoid all forms of artificial light and get her circadian rhythms back in perfect, is as perfect balance as possible by making sure to go outside and be in sunlight at the different parts of the day while the sun's doing different parts of its light cycle. And she totally cured the supposedly incurable Lyme disease just by addressing the circadian rhythm and her, her light life. Right. And wow. th this EMF question is, is in the same ballpark because even though it's invisible to our eyes, it's a type of light. It's part of the light spectrum. Right. Yeah. Interesting. You br bring up Lyme. That was one of the things I was, di I never had an official diagnosis, but um, that was one of the things I was told that I probably had. You know, when I was spending my spending several years trying to figure out what was wrong and changing my diet and cutting out, adding and cutting out different foods and really trying to. Um, but there was always this missing piece, like something was wrong and I could not pinpoint it and still had these weird autoimmune type uh, um, uh, um, symptoms. So cutting out the artificial electrical fields, it um, was the missing piece. and I'm pretty much 100% healthy now. I can't even think of anything that's really wrong. But when I do go to town, it all comes back immediately and to the point where I'm probably not even safe to drive if I'm there too long. But out here in the country, I'm totally fine. I get up in the morning and milk the goats and, you know, work on construction projects around the farm and um, pretty much good to go till evening And I, when I go to bed. Well, let's actually talk a little bit about, you know, your book shares a lot of uh, examples of this, but maybe starting with the problems that the mainstream so-called research on the effects of electromagnetic fields on biological systems, like what are the problems with that research? You know, maybe that'd be a good place to start. Right. Well, the first problem is that the telecommunications companies do their own research. So, you know, maybe there's some conflict of interest there. You know, you call me a paranoid conspiracy theorist, but maybe if the telecommunications companies are doing their own studies and paying scientists to get to give them the results that they want, maybe there's a conflict of interest there, especially when thousands of independent studies that you can look up on Google or PubMed, you can look up studies on um, adverse effects of wireless radiation, and there's lots of studies that show that there are adverse uh, health effects, including cancer. And um, so, you know, just I'd say people should do their own research on this. Don't just take my word for it. But yeah, there's um, cancer clusters, they call it, around cell phone towers where people get tend to get, especially kids, tend to get sicker and there's more cancer around those areas. Yeah. And one of the actually maybe more honest <laughs> studies because you found some like this one from Yale where they put cell phones above pregnant mouse cages 
and the offspring had behavioral problems like hyperactivity. So, right. you know, to back up a little bit, I don't know how much you know about me or, or stuff I talk about on this show, but I do a practice called biofield tuning, which uses right. sound to comb out the issues of somebody's own personal electromagnetic field, which would be interesting to talk about that as well. The electric nature of our body and our own EMF field. But essentially, you know, what I, what I perceive as the issue with a lot of people in health is that they get a type of overload of energy. You know, this is where grounding comes in, that their system is like oversaturated and they can't take on any more. And one of the, one of the ways that can express for kids is like hyperactivity, inability to focus or concentrate on anything because they, they're already at max capacity. It's sort of like, you know, having too many programs open on a computer or something along those lines. But, you know, is there uh, anything you want to share or your insights about the electric nature of our bodies and, and, you know, how knowing about that, you can make lifestyle choices that support that? Uh, sure. Well, I know that it, um, that artificial EMF, it overloads the, the meridian system. And this is not the prevailing theory of what causes electrosensitivity is the, that it's the degradation of the myelin sheath around the nerves, which is kind of the insulating cable that surrounds the nerves. So the theory goes that if that's damaged, whether from pesticides or Lyme disease or whatever, that our nerves become more reactive. Um, so, th I mean, that very well may be true, but another, um, uh, there is also a depth, uh, more little known, um, hypothesis that it's that it's the meridian system that's actually more the cause of this and the yeah the acupuncture meridians and this system it gets overloaded by the artificial emf and then that causes inflammation in all parts of the body and i think this very likely is true because i had these points on my head that corresponded to the gallbladder meridian which apparently is the gate, sort of the gatekeeper between the in, inner and outer world. Um, and anyway, getting acupuncture and craniosacral therapy definitely helped me with symptoms, although I don't, it, you know, it didn't stop me from being sensitive, but it helped smooth out the energy field, you could say. Um, now, as far as hyperactivity goes, I noticed in the 90s there was a definite rise in kids being diagnosed as ADHD and giving medication and stuff. And I, I definitely had ADD myself, couldn't constantly, I went from being a straight A student to being a D student in the late nineties. And just because I couldn't concentrate, especially on stuff like math or um, um, anything technical and like left brained, just um, that switched off and started working, st uh, stopped working. My creative side never went away. And, still good at um, science and English and stuff but yeah there were just definite things that switch off switched off and continue to switch off if I go into town I find I lose concentration on um, certain things but out here without the wireless fields I can you know I can spend all day writing a book or concentrate on whatever yeah and there's definitely <laughs> There's definitely like the litigious uh, safety net out there that is just sort of invisible to people. You know, everyone's prone to just click yes on the terms and conditions. But uh, what do the operation manuals for the smartphone say about their own use? All right. Yeah, they say to hold it away from your head. And people generally don't do that. And also the the safety tests that are that they already rig, they um, they do hold it away from their, well, their head or the fake head that they're using to test on one of their tests or whatever they're doing. They, they um, use it that way. But yeah, they say to hold it away from there. And that still gives me a headache if I do it, but not as bad. It's definitely the radiation levels are a lot less than if it is right next to your brain. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, maybe we can talk a little bit more about how EMF sensitivity feels. Uh, one of the you, you have a list of descriptions, and one of them, a lot of them colorful, but one is like, I'm under attack, psychic attack by Voldemort. 
or something. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about it for yourself, but in the course of your research, you've probably come across the a more wide variety of ways that this might influence people. And perhaps it would be good to uh, to go through the the range of what these effects can feel like. So people listening might be able to pinpoint like that. Uh, maybe I should be paying more attention to my EMF uh, pol- the EMF, the EMF pollution in my immediate environment to uh, mitigate some of these type of symptoms. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, severe headaches, especially in including migraines, um, nerve pain. Sometimes I'll feel, or usually I'll feel like a tingling up both of my arms, kind of like you're, if you've ever been in water near an electric fence, I have once and it felt like that, or um, yeah, just like a low level of electrocution, I guess. Um, severe brain fog, um, acid indigestion, major gut problems, blood pre- oh, blood pressure irregularities is a big one. Like I'll just feel this pressure. Um, I had at my worst, I had varicose veins on my arms and legs after a lar- that popped up overnight after a large exposure. Um, it's terrible. Um, lymphatic swelling. Um, yeah, blood sugar problems, joint swelling, facial like my. Uh, face used to be kind of messed up and my my right eye would twitch and still does if I'm around the fields. Um, Yeah, weird rashes. I had this, I know this lady in town who would get a rash like all across her chest and face when she was around wireless. Um, Yeah, dizziness is a big one. Um, Thyroid issues is a big long-term one. I used to have low, take medication for low thyroid and now it's completely fine, went away. yeah, um, yeah. I guess those are. Oh, yeah, projectile vomiting. That's a real fun one. Um, and yeah, disor. Yeah, mostly disorientation, brain fog, um, not being able to find your way across a parking lot, or a, even not to mention not being able to find your way across town if you're driving. Which doesn't matter, I guess. Now people have GPS. Um, well, it makes me think about the whole in the lowest common denominator of society, the like people of Walmart meme, if you will, that maybe, you know, this is obviously labeled as like a a pseudo condition by the mainstream, by go read about electromagnetic sensitivity on Wikipedia, as you listed in your book. And it pretty much just attempts to explain it away as in all in their head. (laughs) But if one of the the primary sort of nebulous element elements of how it affects people is disorientation and you look at the the general state of people in western culture and they they often seem just to be functionally disoriented you know what i mean like i wonder how much of this is 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 actually a type of full spectrum warfare to uh, control the population by just keeping them at a certain lower level of consciousness that makes them more compliant it seems likely well it definitely has that effect and whether or whether it's planned by people who are trying to kill us or whether we are trying just killing ourselves by our own selves embracing it i i think uh, it doesn't really matter the the point is if there's a parasite you shouldn't feed it so we should stop feeding big tech with our dollars and our attention and it'll go away on its own yeah, and that's a good point. And, you know, you, it makes you wonder, like, why would someone do this to the environment that they themselves have to exist in? Well, there's a lot of craziness in the world. I'll just, you know, <laughs> just because somebody is pulling strings doesn't mean that they're not insane. But anyway, as far as it affecting people on a large scale, um, some of us within the community uh, are taking issue with the term electrosensitive or EHS. And um, uh, that's because they're, the, the, the thinking is that it's uh, taking attention away from the fact that it's actually this issue that's affecting everyone and all life on Earth. And if it's just if people have this assumption that it's only a few freaks like me that it's affecting, then, you know, they might not care as much. You can just say you can just whatever, go live under a rock or whatever. But it's actually a much bigger issue than that. It's affecting everyone. And pe- even people who don't identify as electrosensitive, 
invariably, if they turn their Wi-Fi off at night, they start feeling a lot better. And if they get away from it even a little more, like maybe their long-term problems, like their arthritis and thyroid issues and ADHD and all of these weird um, modern diseases, they start to fade away if they get away from the fields. But the problem is they're so oversaturated with the fields and people are addicted to them because it's it's what's running our society right now. And there's fewer and fewer places to get away from it. But if people did just take a chance and do a digital detox, they might notice that they that things are different and that they feel a lot better. Yeah, you make a, an interesting point in the book about the rise of the modern epidemic of all kinds of addictions that that could be related to wireless tech. Is there more you could say about that? No, there's such a crossover. I mean, I was addicted majorly to caffeine. I'll have a cup of coffee here and there, but I mean, I was drinking those high powered energy drinks just to, just to get through a day and make me not feel like total crap. And also alcohol helped. And, um, you know, there's so much addiction now, but it's like, I think that partially why people are doing it is to manage their symptoms. Um, because we're all feeling these electrical fields at some point or another. I mean, I'll drink a cup of coffee and it'll get me through town without, and I won't crash my car or, or have a seizure because, you know, it's a stimulant and it'll offset the effects of the artificial electromagnetic fields. But it's like on a chronic level, I mean, um, all in all of these bad drugs that people are doing, I think that it might be even keeping them alive or keeping them from having a more severe reaction to the high levels of wireless that they're dealing with on a daily basis. And, um, and the correlation with addiction too is that you see the tech itself is addictive. I recently got a Facebook for the first time ever to promote my book and I'm glad I did. And I'm, I'm meeting a lot of people who are reaching out to me all the time and just ask, you know, about who are, um, new, newly electrosensitive and, um, so it's been a positive thing, but I can see how it's addictive. It, you, you know, you keep wanting to click lo- to like things and to check if anyone's responded to you. And, it, you know, it's it's an instant dopamine hit and it's kind of lame and stupid, but it's kind of addictive at the same time, you know. But mine is it's on a landline computer that I have to turn on and off. It's not in my pocket, like, you know, notifying me every five seconds about something. I can't imagine. And then being a kid growing up with something like this, I don't think it's doing good things for the human psychology. No, definitely not. And maybe this is a good point to talk a little bit about the risk factors for electrosensitive, that there are certain, I don't know, pre-existing conditions, you might call it, that are potentially related to tipping past the threshold to where it becomes like a noticeable impact on your life experience right um well it's um a lot more commonly diagnosed in females and i said in my book that 90 percent of sufferers are female i'm starting to change my mind off about this i'm seeing a lot more people who a, a lot more men having it these days and i think it's just maybe underdiagnosed as men because in men because they probably don't want to talk about it as much and it's you know, maybe manifests in different, in different ways than in women. But so, yeah, anyone can get it. But um, there's risk factors. Um, people who have um, other sensitivities, such as chemical sensitivity, there's a huge overlap with. And many of the symptoms are the same, and the two work synergistically with each other. Um, and then, um, yeah, mercury fillings are a risk factor. Um, so is... Um, yeah, gluten intolerance is usually involved. Candida is a huge one. Like most people who have severe sensitivity to electromagnetic fields also have candida issues. Um, and uh, yeah, mo- oh, black mold is a huge risk factor. Um, and then a history of diagnosis of different mental illnesses that um, miraculously go away if you get away from wireless, but. Anyway, like all of these things like ADHD and bipolar are implicated. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, those are the main ones that I can think of offhand. 
And you know, that really fits into my understanding of our, how our energy field is the scaffolding for our physical and mental health, that it's like this bubble of our own personal electromagnetic energy is the reservoir of our energy and our memory and just basically has this symbolic or representative element about our own flow state or lack thereof. So you mentioned the uh, the high blood pressure being one of the common symptoms and that the when you put that in context with the hmm, like gut issues that also become commonly associated with EMF sensitivity, I'm realizing that I've tuned a bunch of people where the uh, the sacral center, the second chakra, which is also where the stomach is at and part of the digestive tract, the, sec, the bottom chakra, the root chakra is also more the pathway of elimination. But the second energy center has this quality of uh, on, on the left side, which is the receptive side. It has this quality of governing our the flow of everything in, in things that flow and fluidity, right? So this would be like your creative flow state ability, you know, to chain together uh, actions without overthinking it or getting your own way or getting interrupted or stopped, but also flow in the body of actual fluid dynamics. So blood pressure would be a part of that. And I have, uh, you know, I've had a, I've had plenty of clients actually more so lately where the issue ends up being for them that this flow area of their uh, energy field has some sort of mm, like limiting belief and experience a pattern of experience where they, t they tend to be knocked out of their flow or they there's a mm, over overload of energy that doesn't allow for a proper, like things coming in, things going out. And, and that's related to, uh, you know, that same side of the body and that same energy center is also related to the threshold of like satisfaction versus uh, dissatisfaction or fulfillment versus not feeling fulfilled. So there's, there seems to be something going on at that particular level. And maybe <laughs> it's, it's a little nebulous still at this point, but maybe the, hmm, you know, maybe there's a way that somebody who's developed this type of sensitivity can actually downgrade uh, the threshold of how much it affects them by working in that level. And I'm wondering, you know, if we could talk a little bit about the, uh, <laughs> you know, the going up or down on the threshold of how sensitive you are, because that's something you, you sort of were able to categorize with the information that you've learned about this, that there's different, there's the alpha levels is what they're described as. And, you know, I think that it's something that maybe people could, uh, could work on and, and not have such a severe reaction in the future. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, there are these threats. So yeah, there are these thresholds referred to as the alpha levels and usually they're caused by a large exposure. Uh, one of mine was caused by climbing a cell tower after, um, after a month of um, this intense hitchhiking trip I took where I was exposed to all kinds of things, sleeping under high voltage lines and sometimes getting dropped off near a cell tower, you know, because you, you don't have control over where you're dropped off. And during this time, you know, not eating properly, not sleeping properly, getting exposed to pesticides. Um, so it was like a month of that. And at the end of which I climbed a cell tower and you ask, uh, you might, listeners might wonder, like, how could you be so stupid? But um, in my defense, back in those days, I didn't know anything. Like, I just thought that I was going crazy and that I should face my fears, you know, and I was hanging out with this friend who liked to climb things. And so I followed him up the cell tower, and then immediately felt di dizzy and nauseous. And um, for the rest of the day, I still felt awful. And really, for the rest of the week, I felt awful. And I've always and after that whole experience and you know preceded by that road trip I never really felt the same since um so and then I later had a, th a second thresholding effect several years later so I was still able to go to town and kind of function for at least a few hours or a day at a time uh during those years but the second thresholding effect was I had this seizure-like event. I don't know exactly what it was, but it felt like I was like, convulsing um, uncontrollably. After a large exposure, 
in the waiting room at a hospital when I was wait, waiting to get blood work um, as for some re routine tests because I was having stomach I digestive issues. Um, so I just had this um, seizure, weird seizure-like event. And the next day, it was like there was an invisible electrical fence around almost the entire world. And the only way to really get away from it was to go out into the national forest, like out of cell, cell tower range. And I would feel completely fine. But then I would go try to go into a house and like um, get really messed up. That was when the varicose veins appeared and I was having these um, serious problems like um, pounding headaches and um, my face was all messed up and twitching and um, and I've never, and I, I came back from the brink a little bit. I spent six months living in the, living in an abandoned house with almost no field exposure and really came, uh, yeah, I got healthy, a little healthier, came back from, and megadosed on lion's mane um, and mushroom, which helps with regrowth of the neurons. So I was able to come back from the brink to where I'm not reacting to every little thing so much. And, but things still never completely went back to normal. It's very hard to reverse this, but it can't, um, but it's different for every person. Uh, somebody I know who had a titanium dental bridge, they took, they got that removed and their symptoms almost, this was the lady who had the rashes and that stopped happening. And she's, she's to the point where she has a job in a large city and can handle that um, for a few days at a time although still doesn't have Wi-Fi in her house. So it, it can be reversed in some people. Uh, but, um, you know, just it's just better to not let it happen in the first place and try to minimize your exposure as much as you can. Absolutely. Well, that's, yeah, that's definitely the truth. <laughs> uh, just because you could survive eating, I don't know, McDonald's doesn't mean right. you should. But right. There's exactly. an interesting thing about the people's insensitivity to it could potentially be due to them already being sick. Right. Uh, could you talk about that and like how, how you've noticed that in yourself and, you know, back to the McDonald's uh, example. Right. Uh, right. I mean, you healthy might people your, eat you that might and they would be destroyed. A dose of McDonald's every day to not, <laughs> to not become electrosensitive, but then you might also drop dead of a heart attack you know so but well, there's uh, people who have that bad diet they can eat that and not notice anything different so yeah, in the same sense maybe this people who are already sick are I, I not think noticing. it is it's like there's a correlation and um because people who become um so-called electrosensitive are usually pretty healthy when it happened i was in the prime condition of my life when this happened and uh and you know like hiking 10 miles a day with a heavy backpack but then this happened so and then also I've noticed um, that on other times, like if I've eaten a bunch of sugary crap, I've, it's maybe not feel the fields, but with devastating results the next day. So, yeah, I think there's a there's a definite and supposedly when they did some of the early um, experiments with electricity in the 1800s, they noticed that one, there was a um, high variability between different individuals and how much current it took to um, provoke a reaction. This was just DC powered electrical shocks. People would line up and um, touch an electric shock box and get an electric shock um, just because um, they didn't have anything else to do. They didn't have Netflix back then. They had to do something <laughs> for fun. So, they, so they, they noticed that, yeah, there was a, di a difference in the amount of current it took for people. But also they noticed that if somebody had a cold or flu, they'd be, barely feel the shocks at all. So there's there's some kind there's some there's something there. There's some kind of protective um, mechanism, uh, or a dulling of their yeah, sensitivity. Yeah, dulling of senses, for sure. Because you know one of the one of the ways to understand your own electromagnetic field is that this is the like energy and consciousness have a correlation in the universe. And <laughs> that maybe opens up some weird doors about, is there some sort of artificial consciousness writing on the <laughs> currents of the interconnected world of, our, you know, the technological world. But when our energy is in a high state of coherence that IE we're in health, 
we have a higher degree of consciousness. We notice more. We, we hear, um, we hear music differently. We see colors more brightly and distinctly. You know, we, we feel our feelings more completely and that's consciousness is feeling. It's the same thing. So, you know, whenever you've got a cold or something, you can't always necessarily get foggy headed, right? You can't always necessarily think the same quality of thoughts or, uh, you know, your consciousness is dulled by that. So it makes sense that maybe that's an explanatory factor of why kind of low consciousness people can continue doing the things that are, are low vibrational, if you will, that's not, you know, not literally low vibrational, but that's the new age phrase people use right. and uh, not really continue to not notice because they're already in a state of not noticing. Right. I mean, you can waddle around Walmart and not really notice the horrible music blaring at you or the, um, the disgusting chemicals from the bad aisle, you know, where all the laundry detergents are. And um, that just the sensory overload that would be driving me to insanity. Other people don't even notice, but they don't, they also don't notice that they have a giant ulcer or a um, blood pressure problems or really notice anything's going wrong until their doctor tells them because they've completely outsourced their, um, their body consciousness and their consciousness altogether to these outside entities. But is this really this the state of existence that is the pinnacle of human achievement that we should be striving for? Or should we be trying to, you know, uh, you know, be healthy and expand our consciousness and, you know, strive to, um, I don't know, have higher goals than, uh, you know, watching the newest thing on Netflix or whatever. So, I want to spend some time in this first section on solutions. And in the book, you go through several, whether it's the, uh, <laughs> the crystal paraphernalia of the bliss ninny or the herbalism or the diet for an EMF sensitive and helping with gut problems, grounding and specifically grounding, enabling technologies or electro safe building solutions. You give a whole wide range of, of things that could be solutions. So what would you put on the top of that list? And can we talk about what you consider the top of the list for solutions? Well, I mean, the top of the list would have to be getting getting away from the fields for one thing and turning off your Wi-Fi and going, getting a landline if you can, or at least turning it off at night to start with and see how you feel. And then maybe when your health gets a lot better, then you'll be inspired to get a landline and not use. But then um, after that, um, as far as um, mitigating exposures that we're not so much in control of, I'd say the first thing would be um, uh, wearing leather really helps. This is my cool leather helmet. You can see it kind of looks like a old style aviator helmet. And uh, I wear it when I go to town, it looks cool. And leather coats, um, and you can test with a meter that there's a significant reduction in the fields. It blocks a lot. And speaking of the meter, so yeah, the, actually the most important thing is- So it doesn't block EMF, it just reduces the intensity though? Um, it actually blocks a significant amount. I'll see the, the numbers on the meter go down. If I'm in a saturated environment and I take the meter and put it under my coat and I, like, I see the numbers go down. And it also um, uh, attenuates the, the waves, so they're not so harmful. It kind of smooths out the jagged peaks in the, in the wave. Um, but yeah, so leather leather's the best, but also wearing wool or cotton or linen, other natural fibers, really help with the, um, just decreasing the electrostatic charge on your body itself, and therefore, um, you know, just making you less reactive to the fields. A polyester is not so good. It um, creates a positive electrostatic charge and has little microfibers that get stuck in your, your lungs and stuff. Um, so speaking on the topic of clothing, so you've probably everybody's seen these ads for these beanies and special magic underwear and stuff that's supposed to protect you from EMF. Um, don't waste your money. Like It might help a little bit. I, I purchased, a, purchased a suit at one point and I found that it helped me the first couple of times I wore it and then no effect, you know, it, in some cases it can even make it worse because you're creating a, um, it's not a closed, it's not a closed Faraday cage, the radiation still getting in and then potentially bouncing around, you know, so, uh, and metals conductive. 
So, and that goes for um, shielding fabrics and paints and stuff. It's like, it works for some people, for most people, it doesn't work and can even make it worse. But, you know, would you, would you say that there's an exception to that with maybe a, like a fully enclosed bag that you could put a cell phone in or a other type of device that would otherwise have a signal in? Right. But you shouldn't have a cell phone to begin with. You should just take a big rock and smash it and then problem <laughs> solved. Um, yeah, but but very but few anyway. people are, are ready to take that step. So no, realistically, know. you know, I feel like that's uh, having one of those silver lined bags for a cell phone would be great for if you did want to, if you were going out to nature, for example, and wanted to go on a hike, but you could, you couldn't feel safe enough to maybe leave behind the potential for a 911 call or something that you could have one of those bags that completely, you know, put it in airplane mode too, and then have it completely sealed in one of those lined bags. That'd probably mm -hmm. be still a good solution. It, it's a, it's a good first step and they do work because it's, it is, it is a closed, not that I've used one, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a closed system and it would stop the radiation. I still wouldn't put it on my, in my pocket because it might radi you know, uh, for one thing, nothing blocks a magnetic field. You can block the electrical part a little easier, but magnetics you can't really shield for. But they don't, the magnetics don't go out very far either, maybe an inch or so around the device. Um, but yeah, anyway, yeah, that would work. Um, and some people have, some people have um, good luck from the shielded, with the shielded bed canopies. It's just, it's a, it's a case by case basis when you're using metal. Yeah, and but, the shielded, I mean, uh, shielded bed what? Uh, like the bed canopies that have the, okay. with the with the silver mesh, like a lot of people have had good results with that. But in some cases, it can make it worse, depending on what the electrical environment in the house is. Um, so, yeah, but as far as shielding, um, what I do is I, um, there's a recipe in my book for it. It was developed by my friend Gary Duncan, but it's um, it's a mixture of sand and wood glue. And you paint your walls with that, and that blocks uh, blocks it significantly because sand is silica, and it's a semiconductor, so it only lets the EMF go through in one direction. But with with you know with a wall of sand, it's going in all it's um effect, it effectively blocks it because it can't. I've it, heard shungite always, right. you can get powdered shungite to do a similar thing. I believe that's even oh. being used effectively to prevent bee colonies having collapses from, you know, there's been all this talk for many years about save the bees. What's happening to the bees? <laughs> Seems pretty obvious what the uh, the factor is that's in interfering with the bees. But I've heard that uh, powdered shungite in a paint on the beehives is really good. So if that's good for them, no reason why that wouldn't be good to put on your own walls. Right. Um, I painted my walls with it in my camper. And I think it does help, although I don't have strong electromagnetic fields where I live, but, you know, better, good to be as safe as you can. And um, actually, at this point, I think I'm going to have to plug in my computer. So if you just wait a minute, I'm going to go get up and turn it on. OK, I, actually, if you're good with it, why don't we uh, make our transition here to the second part? And if you have just a moment and want to let people know. Again, the name of your book or other ways that they can connect with you or or find out more about this uh, research? Yeah, the, the book um, Under a Rock, an Electrosensitive Survival Guide. You can find it on, on Amazon. Um, also, uh, I have a page on medium.com where I post some of my some shorter writings, like articles that I've done. Um, I do have a Facebook as well. So, um, yeah, those are the main those are the main uh, ways to get a hold of me. Very cool. Well, we still have quite a few in the range of uh, solutions to talk about in the second part. So thanks for being here, Julia. And for anybody out there that wants to learn more about this topic, you, there's not a lot of work on it yet in book form. So Julia's book is going to be a really good bet. Uh, we'll see everybody on the other side. Thanks for being here, Julia.
All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. I had a fun time with this one. Yeah, the subject matter maybe itself isn't that fun. <laughs> Who wants to think about the fact that we're being, you know, generally microwaved by the soup of electromagnetic frequencies in our environment? But it is what it is. And I, I think, you know, if you were to look at people with this sensitivity and who have symptoms from it, maybe the average normie's first response would be like, oh, well, they're just hypochondriacs or they're just kind of a wuss or something like that. But if you read Julia's book, assuming her life experiences are true that she talks about there, she's one of the toughest people I've ever read a book by, you know, like living in caves and <laughs> basically a, an actual nomad and being able to cook and catch your own squirrels and rabbits and sometimes even eating from dumpsters or roadkill. Like I, I don't have it in me to do that. I'm not recommending other people do that either. But the fact that she is able to means that she's not just, uh, you know, not just a, a pansy, <laughs> if you will. I'm, I'm really glad for her. Like one of the reasons that I decided to take this uh, show on is because of the fact that she's now homesteading and raising goats and you know she's living the solutions not just talking about the problem which to me is everything so i'm really glad that we're able to showcase that i do think you know as somebody that is a, a human biofield tuner i do think that there's actually a cure for this or at the very least maybe cure is not the right word but the ability to build up resilience to it we'll talk more about that but if you guys enjoyed the first part of the show we did have to cut a little earlier than one hour, the same for part two. So it's a, a bit shorter of a show. Uh, sometimes that's just how it is. <laughs> she's, she's living what she preaches. So she doesn't have her laptop plugged in while she's near it, which means we could only go for as long as the charge held and then took, take a break, let it charge some more, then get in again. And uh, that's why it's a 45 minute show on the first part and the second part, another 45 minutes. But if you are interested in more of the the solutions, we do get into that in part two. First of all, you can get it by joining Rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N dot com slash interverse. Get yourself a subscription to my Rockfin and you'll be able to hear all the content that I've made throughout the time I've been on there and join us for live streams, even when they are on a paywall, avoiding YouTube completely, which is great. You will also have access to everybody else on the Rockfin network. So there's a lot of good reasons to join there. Or you can become a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash interverse, which will get you the entire archive of everything I've ever done that has a paywall. And I think, you know, that's a better deal kind of, but you're just getting me. So that's only five bucks a month. I mean, at this point in 2024, I'm practically asking you for like, a, you know, a high five and you're in five bucks is in a month is, is very little. So I, I appreciate everyone that's already supported me that way. There are other ways to support the show. We'll go over that after uh, I'm done my outro. But the questions that we got into in the second part, first of all, should electromagnetic field sensitivity be cured? Uh, and, you know, that question is like, is it is it something you actually want to do away with your ability to detect when you're in some kind of dissonant field? Very interesting question. We also discussed Julia's thoughts on organite and shungite, particularly things like what Mitch, the organ donor, does and gifting the towers and all that. We discussed personal coherence as a big solution to convert dissonant fields into livable ones. I've got more to say about that. We discussed getting out of victim mentality. That is huge, man, because that's definitely going to be a factor for people who feel that they have symptoms from EMF fields. Uh, that they're doing it to me or, you know, I can't win no matter what, I'm going to get sick from this. So we talked about that and she has a good perspective on that. And I think, you know, she's hella tough. So grounding and grounding technologies was the next subject. That is interesting. There's more to it than I had heard of before I, ways that you can ground more efficiently using very easy to create yourself solutions. Very cool. Uh, you'll feel like a, a wacky advent, inventor too. We discussed herbalism for electrosensitives and some things like yarrow and other herbs that are going to be very effective for the types of issues, the flow issues, in my opinion, that are part of this con conversation of charge and discharge. Also, eyesight, you know, improving eyesight that has been diminished by screen exposure, 
is a, a big one, which I think plays right in to the flow thing. Diet for EMF sensitives was the last part of our subject matter. And yeah, so we covered a lot of ground there in a shorter amount of time, but you know, we were efficient and effective. Now, I want to talk about, you know, there's some cool quotes that I, I discovered. I was doing a little research on the Unity Church and like the Christian science movement. And, and you know, I'm not endorsing the people whose quotes I'm about to put out there, but I liked these particular statements. First is from Charles Fillmore. He says, when the body is devitalized by excessive labor, dissipation, or any loss of vital force, its aura shrinks away. And a consciousness akin to that of being unclothed is evident. When the mind is adjusted to the divine law, all the vital forces flow harmoniously and the aura glows about the body as a beautiful white light, protecting it from all discord with, from without and purifying it continually from within. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the first part of what I want to get into is that I think that you can create a type of energy field coherence that is going to dramatically increase your resilience to things that otherwise might be causing you sensitive, um, causing you symptoms. You know, there's beyond just the electromagnetic field put off by something like say your smart refrigerator or even just a regular refrigerator, anything electronic, the there's other elements to this that are attacking your attacking your boundaries at all times. And that would be stuff like, the way the fridge makes a sound, you know, there's just that background hum that is in your house and in public places and the fluorescent lights and all that. There are things that just to exist in the modern world, you have to pretty much just tune it out, right? Like, <laughs> right. Just this annoying noise that to even uh, function, there's a part of your energetic mm, Total totality, right? Part of your consciousness is actually being held up. Like it's taking RAM or bandwidth. It's like a program running in your experience is that sound that's just always there. So a certain amount of your personal energy, which is your consciousness is just dedicated to taking in that sound and then compartmentalizing it out, making it separate from the rest of your experience so that you're not, you don't feel like you're constantly assaulted by it. So tuning things out is itself part of our abilities to shield ourselves, And the more things we have to tune out, the more of a drain it is on our battery, which means, you know, if there's more than just sound we're tuning out, there's also these other dissonant types of field energies and, and radiative things in the electricity of our environment, then our, our battery is constantly taking, uh, is constantly getting drained by that. <laughs> and that's, that's a fact. But there are ways that we can increase our voltage in kind. And maybe in today's age of convenience, it's offset by all the things that you're going to have to go out of your way to do to improve your electrical charge, like grounding, like making sure you're eating the right stuff, not the wrong stuff. But, you know, the, the end of the book, Electric Body, Electric Health, Eileen McCusick's great work on the electric nature of the body. She gives a whole list of these solutions, like 15 different ways to increase your voltage. <laughs> Choosing things that are uh, ah, instead of uh, <laughs> hanging out with people that are energetic donors rather than energy stealers. There's a whole list of ways that you can do it. But at the end of the day, um, we need to be mindful and consistently offsetting the energy drains with energy boosts. And that's just the way of it. And the more we can keep that, keep on top of that, the more resilient we're going to be to things. And we're going to be able to go out into these dissonant environments and be okay uh, <laughs> and last longer before we feel worn out by it. There's also the fact that the universe has a, a natural coherence versus dissonance principle that coherence wins. That is just the way it is. The more coherent energy field entrains the dissonant one, which means when you go into the place with the coherent field and the, you have that, and then there's dissonance around, you have an immunity to it and actually transmute it. I think that, um, you know, maybe not everybody is going to agree with that, but it's my personal experience that that's the case. So 
we we don't want to get rid of our sensitivities because that's a diminishing diminishing of our consciousness, but we do want to increase our resilience so that we can remain functional for as long as possible, right? Then this other quote from another one of these uh like Christian science new thought people from the early 20th century, Phineas Quimby. He says, the trouble is in the mind, for the body is only the house for the mind to dwell in. Therefore, if your mind had been deceived by some invisible enemy into a belief, you have put it into the form of a disease, with or without your knowledge. But my theory or truth, I come by my theory or truth, I come in contact with your enemy and restore you to health and happiness. This I do partly mentally and partly by talking till I correct the wrong impression and establish the truth. And the truth is the cure. Man, I love that because that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what biofield tuning is. The forks and the sound and all that are just the detection method for me to find where the lie is at. And then we talk about it and I tell you what the truth is and you either accept it or you don't, but that makes all the difference in the world to your overall level of coherence. And that coherence is your shield. You know, that's uh, the healthy boundary. That's the transmuting factor. We all have the ability to be in that place, to be able to do that. I, I promise. I promise. Uh, so if you're interested in biofield tuning, hit me up, chance at interversepodcast.com or learn more about it at interversepodcast.com slash sound dash healing. Both of those things will be linked in the show notes of every episode. There's especially on the herbalism topic, like say you want to get some yarrow and improve the flow uh, situation in your field, which is also going to be completely related to your ability to deal with this charge and discharge ratio of our experience in the electrified, artificially electrified world. Uh, check out Tippica New Herbs. I'll say it again. I've said it before. It's great. Everything they have is great. Kyle is an absolute gentleman wizard master scholar badass great friend love that guy use the interverse coupon code get 10 percent off on your typical new herb purchase again i think if you're having electrosensitivity first things first just get some yarrow get a tincture or a tea of it whatever you want and see how that treats you there's solutions guys i did not take on this episode to just be like oh look what they're doing to us i want the solutions to be the focus of the conversation because regardless of whether or not you're one of the EMF sensitive people or on the threshold or someday become one, whatever, the solutions for it are the exact same as what practices that you put into effect to be the healthiest, brightest, best version of you, which is what we want. That's what we want for you. It's what I want for you. And that's what I love about what I do. And, you know, the maybe smaller but absolutely elite audience that we've got is that when we have the live streams, whenever I have the opportunity to interact with the audience, the ones that are able to be there and present in the real time when we're doing the thing, you, you know, th there's occasionally pruning that has to take place, ban banning for life and whatnot. But overall, it's very little. You go into other people's chats. Yeah, sure. Maybe their live audience is like three, four, five times more than who we have hanging out. But you see a bunch of retarded shit. <laughs> Just like you know, victim -y things or, uh, you know, absolute magical thinking that is not the right kind of magical thinking, you know, who am I to judge, but I'm just saying we got the greatest audience in the world. We already have, I, you know, I'm already blessed to be connected with people that are putting these type of solutions into practice. So maybe this episode wasn't for you because you're already there, but maybe this episode is for you to share with somebody else that, Someday when they cross the threshold into being sensitive in ways that they weren't before, who knows, but I had fun. I've had a great day. I always like talking. <laughs> That's why I do it for a living. So hope you guys had fun with it too. Uh, other ways you can support the show, check out interversemerch.com. Get yourself some interverse merch. We've also got Clive DeCarl sells some really great basic supplements, magnesium, vitamin C, things of that nature. Never a bad idea. And uh, AquaCure. You can get yourself the AquaCure AC50 and a, a discount by using my code Interverse. All of that's linked in the show notes. And last but not least, Dylan Sicosio's Spirit World books, the ones that I have done audiobook narrations for, you can pick up 
and use my link and I'll get a much better cut from Amazon. If you use the link in the show notes, whatever way you buy it is fine. I really just want you to have the knowledge because it's uh, life changing to understand the symbolic and linguistic patterns that make up our mythological religious systems of the world. But yeah, I think I'm good. I think I'm I'm done. Been, you know, you got a little extra out of me at the end here because we had a little shorter of an interview. But I'm feeling good. I love you guys. And I hope you all are well and doing the right thing when you can, how you can out there. And I will catch you on the next one. Peace. Mm-hmm.